Well, we're looking into the doctrine of congregational singing, and we have noted that the text for this particular <clears throat> series of messages is Psalm 96, verses 1 through 3. We have noted also the outline for the sermon, and that is that singing is commanded by God, that singing is a means of indoctrination, and that singing is also a means of evangelism. We are now looking at the indoctrination segment of this sermon series and Psalm 96 and verse 2, where we have the words, Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. It is these particular words that I have now put into the red print that give us the primary points of this particular verse. The proclaiming, the subject matter, which is salvation, and then from day to day means the way in which this is supposed to be carried out. Proclaim is the primary uh, passage or the primary words that brings us to our uh, thinking. <clears throat> the text, once again, is proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. The key words are... Uh, word units that are closely linked, and the first word is proclaim, the second word is salvation, and the third word is day to day. I've put in the uh, Hebrew uh, fonts in case you're interested in that. Proclaim, the word is basar, and uh, introduction uh, or indoctrination means the reshaping of our thinking. The reshaping of our thinking needs to take place in three specific areas. We saw self, which we've already studied, family, which is where we're at now, and then thirdly, it is church. Family. <clears throat> we have seen self, we've seen family, and under family we've seen that there's a command to teach our families uh, doctrinal material by means of song. Now, as you're aware, um, in our state, it seems that the authority of the parent to teach his child is being taken away. It used to be eroded a little bit at a time, but now it's coming off in big chunks. And... Um, this is one of the reasons why I have said that even though I, it's, I don't feel that it's my ministry to be political from the pulpit, that Christians should run for office. And the office that you need to run for first is school district. That is the basic, it's the easiest one to get into, and it's the one that wields a tremendous amount of power. From there, it's easy to jump to higher offices, and then eventually you could uh, go into the governor's seat or something like that. It uh, does not require you to necessarily have a university education, although some people think that it does. What is necessary is name recognition. That is the basic political know-how. If you have name recognition, you will generally win that particular election. There are some names, for instance, that are rife with <clears throat> that recognition. We find them particularly in Eastern and politics of the Eastern part of our nation. Take, for instance, the Kennedy name. Why is it that there are so many Kennedys that are in public office? Name recognition. Who was the very first Kennedy that didn't have an office? Well, it was old Joe Kennedy, and he was actually a gangster. He uh, was smuggling whiskey into the United States, but he made enough money. He puts his kids through school. His, school, his kids became influential, and one of them became president of the United States. It gives you an idea of what you can do with name recognition. The second thing that we have noted is what we find in our outline, and that is that teaching a family requires a strong, a spiritually strong male leadership. That means that 
There needs to be a strong male in the family in order for spiritual teaching to actually be efficient and to be successful. Two passages of scripture that we're treating, the first one is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 33. The second, which is our, the meat for our message today, is Joshua 24 and verse 15, where we have those very famous words, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So Joshua 24 and verse 15 is that area where we have me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15 <coughs> is an example of strong male spiritual leadership. We will find this in our passage uh, under or the first point, which is me and my house. We'll look at a narrative. We will look at um, the new capacity that Joshua enjoyed as a leader of his people. And then we will see Joshua in a portrait of humility. And I want to treat the life of Joseph with these three major points. And then finally, at the very end, with the fact that he is fully rewarded. Now, I want to bring Joshua up to your attention because he is going to be a person that you will love. He is a person who did everything according to the book. Yes, he was afraid. Yes, he was nervous. But he looked to the Lord for strength, and the Lord provided that strength. And he executed the Lord's will, even though it didn't seem right for him to do that. There were two fantastic events at the very beginning of his leadership career. The first was how to get the people across the Jordan River at flood stage. And it seemed impossible to him, and the Lord told him, just get the men who are carrying the ark to put their pinkies or their toes into the edge of the water, and you will see what will happen. And 20 miles away in the village of Adam, the water stopped and became a wall. And then the water that was in the riverbed of the Jordan River kind of dried up, and the people that were following Joshua were able to cross the Jordan River on dry ground. Impossible. Shouldn't happen. And we might say, well, what kind of a miracle is that? It kind of like, it looks like he's a copycat to Moses. Well, not exactly a copycat. <laughs> and then he's told to march around the strongest stronghold in the area of Canaan, the city of Jericho, and to march around it seven days once a day, and on the seventh day to march around it six times, so a total of 13 times altogether. And then he's told at that time, everybody blows their horn, and when you see the walls tumbling toward you, take a step back, and then take a step forward, and everybody goes in and cleans house. Impossible! And Joshua could have said, Lord, to me, this not only seems unreasonable, but it just seems like you are barking up the wrong tree. This just doesn't happen. But Joshua followed the Lord. And this is the way that strong male leadership behaves. If the Lord says jump, the strong male leader says how high. And that is the object lesson that I want to teach you today. So, as you can see, uh, <clears throat> our first uh, sub-point is going to be me and my house, and I want to say this as an introduction, and that is that it takes a strong leader to speak for the rest of his family. Now, we know how hard it is for us as adults to speak for our adult children. Our adult children have a mind of their own, and they will decide what they will decide. So, if you have lines that are following the will of God, and you are the male leader in your home, then 
the line of your travel is going to be parallel to the will of God. Mm -hmm. What about the will of the other people in your home? What if they're not parallel? What then? Well, when Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, how old was he? <laughs> he was pretty old. So that meant that he had adult children, adult grandchildren, because he died, what, at 120? 110, I think. So this means that there had to be somebody in his family who was, in, who was discordant with Joshua's leadership. But Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. And if somebody didn't want to do it, they would have to bear the consequences. That takes a great deal of male leadership. Okay, let's, let's start. <clears throat> so we are looking at strong male leadership, and that is under Joshua. Me and my house, verse 15 of chapter 25. The image that you have here is Moses putting his hands on Joshua. You have Aaron. He's the guy with the little breastplate there with the different colored stones. And you have other people there who are um, attending what we would sometimes call the ordination of Joshua. This is only an artist's rendition. We don't really know how it happened or how it took place. We just know what the scripture says, and that is that Moses gradually put more and more responsibility on Joshua until finally he took the training wheels off and Joshua took off on his own. Okay, the narrative of the life of Joshua, the son of Nun, is divided into two parts. In each of these parts, Joshua is held entirely or has it holds entirely different positions with regards to the people of Israel and uh, discharged different duties. And let me say first and foremost about this, and that is that in this first point, I want you to see that the life of Joshua in the scriptures does not begin nor does it proceed by saying, oh, Joshua was tall. Joshua was short. Joshua had a good personality. Joshua had a good marriage. None of those things. What it says is that he had a job to do for the Lord, and he did it. That's what it says. He had a job to do before he was promoted as the ultimate leader, and then he had a job to do after he was promoted to be the ultimate leader. His job was, I will do my duty as God's servant. That means that he was not going to be deterred. He was not going to be deflected from doing God's will. He was going to do them. And so you can look at his life throughout the books of the Bible, and you will see there's only two areas that are, that are mentioned about him, and they are all related as to how he was serving God by serving the people. That, of course, presents us with an example. In the earlier period of his life, he is the servant and minister of Moses. This means that he had a high um, index of humility in order to be the servant of another man. I guess we could almost think of him as being the butler, but much more than a butler. He was loyal to his leader, and he turned into being one of the most trusted and valiant captains of the Hebrew army. This Joshua was tremendous, let me tell you. <clears throat> After the death of Moses, he himself succeeds to the leadership of the Israelite army. 
and conducts them to settle successfully in the promised land. I know that the statement sounds almost bland and as dusty as uh, the hills, but he does what he's supposed to do. He fulfills his duty, and he does something which is tremendous because this settles the people who are the children of Jacob, later known as Israel, into the promised land, and the nation of Israel begins because of this one man. Moses didn't do it. Moses brought them out of Egypt. He took them through the desert for 40 years, but who brought them into the promised land? It was Joshua. The service of the earlier years of his life is a preparation for his later life. And the preparation was the training, but it also gave him the equipment to do that job. The equipment means that the responsibility or that there were responsibilities that were gradually given to him or augmented to him so that he would be able to discharge leadership when he would have full responsibility. The history of Joshua in his new capacity as the supreme head and leader of the people. There are several instances where the narrative paints him as a type of Christ. And so let me give you those instances. <clears throat> First of all, there's the name Joshua, which is a contracted form of Jehoshua. And Jehoshua, if you contract it, you can take out the... Uh, Ye and you get Yahshua. So the contracted form has two spellings. The one that we all know is Joshua. In other words, we take out the Ye out of it. <coughs> and the other, which appears in Nehemiah 8.17, and it's spelled Yeshua. If you're acquainted with languages, particularly the Semitic languages, you, you automatically recognize that vowels are kind of like uh, like pennies, you know. Uh, you get a lot of them. And one penny is just as good as another, and that's what happens with vowels. It is the radicals, or it is the consonants, which actually bear the heavy weight in the Hebrew language. The vowels are necessary for us to recognize certain changes. And so an O goes to an E. And that's one time in the Old Testament, Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah is like one of the last books that's written in the Old Testament. Joshua is one of the first people that we run into in the Old Testament. So it spans a thousand or more years. And so it's not hard to think that maybe the vowels would have been changed. Okay. There is a language that we speak today. Well, maybe not us, but uh, Russians speak this language. And do you know that sometimes they pronounce the E as an O? And the O is an E? And we find this usually at the end of a, a name, like if we say Gorbachev, oh, that's an E. But somebody could say Gorbachev, and it's the same, it's the same spelling, different pronunciation. So it's not that difficult to jump from an E to an O and vice versa. The meaning of the name is Jehovah is deliverance or Jehovah is salvation. The name is formed on the analogy of many Israelite names. And what is that analogy? Well, let me give you a number of names that are uh, used here. You have Jehoiakim, Jehohanan, Elishua, or Elisha, and then we have Elitzur. And in all of these cases, you have the name of God at the beginning of the name, and then you have a 
something else at the end of the name. So Jehoiakim, you have Jehovah exalts. Jehoihanam, Jehovah is gracious. You have Elishua or Elisha, God is deliverance. And Elitzur, God is a rock. So this is an analogy of the way in which the Hebrew names are used. They always append or prepend the uh, name of God into uh, their names. Originally, his name was Hoshia, and this is what we have here, Numbers 13, 8, and uh, also verse 16. And Josh, or Moses then changed his name to from Hoshia to Joshua. What he did is that he added one of those little red things that you just saw come up. Should I show it again? Okay, here it comes. And now his name is Joshua. Hoshea, which was his original name, means deliverer or savior. But Joshua means the Lord is salvation. And now Moses changed his name to this. Why? Because he was, shall we say, he was showing that Moses was not taking the credit for saving Israel. He was giving the credit to the Lord. So the name Joshua is a very important name because it means the Lord is salvation, not I am salvation. See, this name, this name change takes place in the 13th chapter of Numbers, verses 8 and 16. The name Joshua, or Joshua, is the name given which our Lord was called, but it was in a Greek form, which is Jesus. So when you say Joshua, that's Hebrew. When you say Jesus, that's Greek, means the same thing. It means the Lord is salvation. Now, why is this so very important? Well, let me tell you why. This name was given to the Lord because he was to save his people from their sins. What did the angel say to Mary? You shall call his name Jesus because he shall save his people from their sins. See? So this name that was given to him, to Joshua, carries a great deal of significance because he is not taking importance to himself. He's given the importance to God. By this distinctive name among men, he was linked to Joshua, that is, our Lord was linked to Joshua, and in the salvation that he accomplishes for his people. We, therefore, are led to expect the same leading characteristics as distinguished the salvation of Israel by Joshua. Example, just as Joshua submitted to the authority of Moses, so Jesus submitted to the authority of God the Father. He was called the minister of Moses. Now, in our minds, we don't quite see that. But if we lived in the ancient world, when somebody was a minister of somebody, it meant that they were like the servant that would wash the feet of their master. They were the ones who took care of the master. And I said, well, we can consider him the butler. Well, let's just take it back a notch because it, there was more humiliation than a butler. A butler usually has, a, you know, a tuxedo on, a black tie. And, you know, he walks around prim and proper. This is the guy that did whatever Moses wanted. Joshua was there to do it. So if Moses said, hey, uh, Joshua, can you run down to the 7-Eleven and get me one of those big gulp slushies? He'd be down there getting it. When Moses said, hey, uh, Joshua, there's a bunch of people that hate us Hebrews. They want to kill us, and they're attacking us at the rear. Get over there and stop them. And so Joshua got an army together. They had only been out of Egypt two months. Hardly had any training. And Joshua could have said, hey, no, these guys don't know how to do battle. Joshua said, yes, sir, and down he went, and he defeated the Amaleks, the Amalekites. 
That's what he was. He submitted to the authority of Moses, just as Jesus submitted to the authority of his father. And just as Joshua saved his people from destruction by the Amalekites, so Jesus saves from the destruction of eternal damnation. So we are able to see these two uh, parallels between them. Number three, a third parallel, just as Joshua leads the people into the promised land, across the Jordan River and the uh, conquest of uh, Jericho, Jesus will establish his millennial kingdom. And by the use of angels, he will call all those Jews who are believers in Christ to go to the promised land and they will populate the millennial kingdom. Jesus Christ is the, uh, the archetype there. In the passage in Deuteronomy, Joshua helped in teaching the people the song. Remember, we talked about the song Deuteronomy 32 in verse 44. Joshua did this. Now, how many men do you know that say, hey, I want to sing in church? Most of them say, hey, you know, my voice is lousy. I think I just sit in the back, not say anything. Not Joshua. The congregation was so large that it was divided. Moses taught the song to one group and Joshua taught the song to the other group. Oops, go back. Joshua used song as a teaching tool. Now, we don't have any artist renditions of Joshua, so I picked this because it makes him look like he was an aggressive, lethal male. Sword in hand, had his face pointed toward the enemy. He was not going to take no guff from nobody. <clears throat> the name of Joshua is contracted from uh, Yehushua. Joshua's first appearance. So let me tell you about his first appearance. I've got to see my phone here. First appearance. The first thing I want to bring to your attention is that in God's organization, that is when God does something, there's always an organization. He doesn't do things helter-skelter. He is a God of order. And so in God's organization, he does not randomly select those uh, who to represent him. Joshua's first appearance in scripture is not a random promotion. It is implied that Joshua had already proven himself to be faithful in the little things, so God chose him to be a commander in his army. The first appearance of Joshua in Bible history is at Rephidim. This Rephidim is um, a wilderness uh, in uh, the uh, Arabian Peninsula, and it is just north of Sinai. Let me give you a map. Okay, how's that map look? Okay, let me make it a little bit bigger. Okay. Okay. And if you can see the red dotted line, this is the uh, proposed uh, route that Moses led the people uh, out of Egypt. They started in Goshen. Remember, I had you fill out those things last, uh, last week. If you follow the red uh, dotted line, you come to Mara, right here. Then you come to Elam, which is the place with the 70 palms. And then you go over here and there's a little curve and that is because this is where the terrain changes. The terrain changes here and um, it becomes from being sandy to being very mountainous. And this is where there are mountains on one side and mountains on the other. And in order for you to travel, you have to go into the canyons. So because there were three or more millions of people coming out of Egypt, they couldn't all fit in those narrow canyons. So they had to string themselves out. 
And if, and I gave you this example last time, let's say you're on the freeway or you're on a ramp to get onto the freeway and you're the 15th or the 20th car back, when the light changes, you have to wait for all those cars in front of you to move. And you say, the light changed, why don't they all just move at once? It is the mystery of life. <laughs> and that's the way it was with the people of Israel. In order for them to fit through those canyons, a few of them had to, had to go. Meanwhile, the others stayed behind and waited for those guys to make their way through. Then the next group would go, and uh, another group would be waiting to be uh, ready to go, and so on and so forth. The last group were called the stragglers, and these were the people that were attacked by the Amalekites. And that all happened on their way to Mount Sinai at a place called Rephidim. And now you can see Rephidim right here. And you can see Mount Sinai is that little circle. And Mount Sinai has two peaks. One is Sinai, the other one is Horeb. And Rephidim, as you can see, is outside. Now, there are no specific distances because this is an ancient uh, description of the travel. And there were no mile markers. There were no highway signs. And so we just know more or less where they were. Besides, this is desolate, desert-type country. And so it's hard for you to know where things are. So... The people then went into Sinai, and at Sinai is where they, uh, where Moses teaches the song to the people. And let me uh, get this uh, out of here. Sinai is this big mountain to the left, and I know that it's hard to get any perspective as to how big this is, but this is a very large mountain. And you can see that there's a plain in the back here, a flat area, and then there's another flat area over here. And apparently the people were divided. Some were in one flat area, the others were in another flat area. And this is where uh, Joshua helped Moses in the teaching of that song. So, his first appearance was in Joshua chapter 17. And in this uh, appearance, uh, Joshua goes to defeat the Amalekites. And he is given the trusted position of leading the armies of Israel, the untrained armies of Israel, against a very hostile group. The Amalekites... Uh, had blood in her eye. They wanted to destroy Israel. They didn't just want to uh, take their weapons and their goods. They wanted to actually kill these people. It was a genocidal uh, campaign. His second appearance is found in Exodus chapter 24. And I only want to introduce this because uh, our time is now running short. But there are several appearances um, before the scripture records that Moses had changed uh, the name uh, from Savior to uh, the Lord saves or the, the Lord brings salvation. In the second appearance, we're able to see that Moses and God had a super good opinion of Joshua. And let me see... The appearance takes place at Mount Sinai, and I'm going to go really fast here so that we can change. Okay. We will come back uh, next time to look at this with much more uh, patient detail. But this is Mount Sinai as it is today, and you can see that there is a trail that goes up to the top. Personally, I would like to go climb. I don't think I would gain any spiritual points out of it, but it would be kind of cool to say I climbed Mount Sinai. You uh, will see an area down here at the bottom, and this is uh, probably where Elisha found a cave 
And this is where the Lord sustained him when uh, Elisha wanted to, uh, or Elijah wanted to commit suicide. He said, I just can't take God's will anymore. Take me home. That was the cave that he rested in. And then I want you to notice that this Mount Sinai has this snaking trail that goes up it. And part of that trail goes to what is known as the cutting. And the cutting is right there. Let's see if this will show. The cutting is right there. So let me go. Okay. In Joshua 24, the Lord gives Moses special instructions. And he says, I want you to come up to the mountain. And I want you to bring a bunch of people. He names three people. And he says, and also bring... 70 of the leaders of Israel and Joshua, although Joshua isn't noted right at the very beginning. So what you see is the first level. That's this yellow level. And that is the instruction that Moses got. Then um, these people had a very important time with the Lord. Uh, this we'll discuss next time that we're together. And... Um, these 70 plus men had an astoundingly unique experience because they saw God. Nobody has ever seen God. In fact, the vision of God here has got to be muted because the Bible says that anybody who sees God will die immediately. So this had to be a muted vision of God. And they... It was such a good meeting that they had a meal there, like a Passover meal or like the Lord's Supper type meal, because this was that important of a time. And then the Lord says to Moses, leave those 70 plus behind, but bring Joshua with you. And so Joshua goes, and you can see on my crude drawing, of about to where the cut is in the other picture that I showed you. And this is where Moses is supposed to bring Joshua. Leave the others behind. Joshua is the only one who was selected. Nobody else. And he was there with Moses for six days. At the end of those six days, on the seventh day, then the Lord says, you come up the rest of the way, but leave Joshua behind. So you can tell that of all the men in Israel, 70 were chosen for this special event of seeing God. And out of those 70 plus men, Joshua was selected to go even higher and to spend six days on the mountain with God. And then Joshua was left behind and Moses went up and he spent 40 days on the mountaintop. We'll cover this the next time that we are together. But I want to point out to you that Joshua was an extraordinary person.